everybody. Welcome to our virtual public meeting for our Unified Development Ordinance Zoning Map Revision. My name is Rachel Bailey. I'm the Zoning Administrator. And good evening. I am Krista Hampton, Director of Planning and Development Services. So we will first go over briefly just our agenda for the meeting. So we have our status and process, key themes of our new UDO, as well as let me get my presentation shared here. Hold on one second. All right, so we have our status and process, key themes of the new UDO, UDO zoning districts, and navigating the draft zoning map. So we will then go over contact information and our question and answer period. So the ordinance was adopted in August of 2019. This was text only. Then we had some revisions approved in June. Through these adoptions, we established new zoning districts. Because all of our districts are changing, that meant we needed to redraw our zoning maps. Our process is lined out here for you. So we're gonna have our virtual public meeting, which we're doing right now. And then we're gonna be offering one-on-one -on -one virtual meetings, which we'll go over later in this presentation. The maps will need to go to planning commission and then they, it will need two readings by council. So our goal is to go to planning commission in either November or December of this year. It'll go to council for zoning public hearing in January with an effective date of March 31st, 2021. And part of this process is also to ensure that we get your input as well. And so at the end of this presentation, we will be laying out how we hope to solicit your input through this process. In a virtual format, we wish we could be in a public meeting with you right now, but we did feel the need to, to go ahead with this very important initiative that's trying to implement some key themes that we laid out through a public process back with Plan Columbia and then also with Columbia Compass. Um, the new Unified Development Ordinance implements these major themes. And the first one is to create a user-friendly code. For those of you who use the code currently, you know it can be hard to find information. Um, we who use it all the time sometimes struggle to find information. So we wanted to make this code as simple as possible for those who maybe just use it day to day, for those who are from out of town. So we have a lot of graphics, a lot of tables um, to help you through that. The second one is to implement Plan Columbia. And there are a number of initiatives and policies within that um, that we hope this new unified development ordinance will help for anything from walkability to um, trying to encourage the redevelopment of buildings and the, the vibrancy of our corridors. The third theme is to modernize regulations um, and strongly encourage and support infill and redevelopment. We are a largely built out city. And so one way we grow is through that infill and redevelopment. So we want the code to help facilitate that type of work. Finally, our fourth theme is to support and encourage sustainable and green development practices. And this is through um, incentives as well as regulations to try to get us there. So the Unified Development Ordinance has a, has base zoning districts that fall into several categories, residential districts. And these, as Rachel will tell you, are largely similar to what we currently have, just different names. So you might now be used to RS1, you just have to add another let, letter in there and she'll talk about those. We currently have largely commercial and industrial districts otherwise. Whereas now we are heavily skewed towards mixed use corridor and center districts. That's what we've heard over the years through our different planning processes and working with the citizens that we want to be able to live, work and play along these corridors. And so you will notice that we have quite a few of those districts. Finally, we have some new districts that um, accommodate our many institutional 
um, users here in the city. We are a state of government and institutions and the ordinance recognizes that. Finally, industrial zoning districts, a very important part of our economy. We accommodate those with our industrial zoning districts. And I'll turn it over to Rachel to begin going through these districts. I have lumped together residential districts that are similar and go together so that we can kind of summarize for you here. To start off, we have our transitional conservation district as well as our large lot reserve district. The purpose of the TC district is to provide land on the edge of the city that is undeveloped or developed at a very low density and to conserve land. This land is either rezoned at the appropriate time or it remains in conservation. An example of this would be wetlands. It would remain in conservation. The LLR reserves undeveloped or low density land located on the edge of the city that will be rezoned at appropriate time to a residential district, for example, that correlates with a planned development. Our single family districts are very similar to our current single family districts. So right now we have RS1, RS2, and RS3. In the new ordinance, we have our large lot district of RSF1, medium lot RSF2, and our small lot of RSF3. The purpose of these districts is to provide lands that accommodate primarily single family detached dwellings at varying densities. District regulations discourage development that substantially interferes with the residential nature of the districts. Our two family districts, so we have the base RD district, which provides lands that accommodate a mix of single family and two family dwellings at moderate densities. We then have our residential two-family Mill Village District. So this is specific to the historic Mill Village area. And again, it accommodates a mix of single family and two-family dwellings at higher densities. Our residential mixed districts, so our RM1 and RM2, are very similar to our current RG1 and RG2 districts. So it's kind of a general mixed residential district. The purpose of these districts is to provide lands that accommodate a moderate density mix of residential development that allows single family, two family, townhouse, as well as small and medium scale multifamily dwellings. The thing to keep in mind with these districts, density requirements still apply as well as lot coverage. So anything more than single family, so something with multiple units, for example, would have to meet density requirements for the land as well as lot coverage, height, and any other development requirements of those districts. Next, we'll go over the mixed use districts that are in the code. The first one is a lower intensity. It's mixed use one and two. And they want to, they are intended to accommodate low to medium density walkable mixed use development. So you can have single family, two family, low level, multifamily dwellings, but you can also have neighborhood serving retail office and services within these so that people can walk to these various services. We have a number of activity center slash corridor districts and these generally align with some of the direction that was in Plain Columbia. What is exciting about these districts is that we now have context-based zoning. Whereas before, if you had a C3, which is general commercial zoning, you would have the same regulations, whether you were in Harbison or on North Main Street or downtown. The context mattered very little. With these new districts, we are able to accommodate the context and get the development that best meets the needs of the area. So the first one is the neighborhood activity center and corridor. And it's intended to serve just really around the neighborhood, the neighborhood surrounding it. So fairly um, low intensity. You might capture some through traffic, um, but generally you don't want uses that are primarily oriented towards automobile. So I like to think of the New York butcher shop over at the end of Gervais Street, um, that area, that district has as being a great example of this. 
Once you go to a bit larger scale, you have your community activity center in corridor district. So you might have this be a draw from a larger area. Um, some auto uses are permitted, but they need to still support that pedestrian friendly development. Um, still allowing for residential as well as commercial. So trying to integrate those uses along the corridor and create a vibrant corridor. Regional activity is just as it says. So you will get a larger draw from the region as a whole. Um, you might think of Harbison as something along the lines of, of this area to some degree. It is intended for primarily commercial. So you still will have residential uses allowed, but it's more high intensity commercial um, while still offering the ability for some higher intensity residential along that area as well. And true to its name, the Downtown Activity Center District is just is for our downtown, our central business district. So some of you who are familiar with zoning might know about C4, C5. Um, it's intended to really be our, um, our business and residential district, which our downtown is quickly becoming a, a vibrant area for um, you both to live and to shop and eat as well as to work. Going into some other districts, our office and institutional largely aligns with our current C1, which is also called office and institutional. Um, outside of the institutional that Rachel will talk about, um, it is intended for kind of our smaller institutional offices. So doctor's offices, government, medical, dental, um, and some professional offices. General commercial aligns with our C3. And so this really is intended to still accommodate those auto related uses and corridors that we have, um, that we have a lot of our shopping, more of our big, big box retailers to ensure that, that those areas are still um, able to thrive. A uh, mixed commercial is somewhat analogous to our uh, downtown activity center, but we that has some distinctions that we needed this other district. Um, very similar to, to some of the MX2, for those of you who are familiar with that. Um, still allowing for multifamily as we've been talking about, so trying to integrate the residential uses. Um, but getting a little bit more flexibility from the use and bulk requirements um, to get some urban densities and the mixed uses so that we, we can facilitate some of the plans that we've had. Next, we have our institutional general district as well as our institutional university medical district. These will often go hand in hand under the new ordinance. The institutional general district is more for development and grouping of multiple institutional buildings and interrelated public, private, and nonprofit development, often affiliated with larger sites such as colleges and government offices. The institutional university and medical district is specifically for medical complexes and large universities. Coordinated site development and off street parking, traffic and pedestrian circulation plans, continuity and comp compatibility with surrounding development is ensured via an institutional development plan or IDP. We also have our institutional transportation utilities district. It provides lands that accommodate transportation uses as well as utility related uses. So you have your airports, your railroad facilities, and your major utility facilities, as well as some supportive uses such as retail and personal services. Our industrial districts are our light industrial, our LI, and our heavy industrial. So light industrial provides lands that mostly will include wholesaling, distribution, storage, processing, research and de development, and other light industrial development and manufacturing. The purpose of the HI district provides lands that accommodate the intense industrial development, but generally requires large sites. So this would be uses that may impact adjacent lands. So heavy manufacturing, warehouse distribution, wholesale, major utility facilities, and research labs. We then have our employment campus district. This provides lands that accommodate a mix of employment, research and development, and light industrial development with an expectation of high quality design. And it's typically within a campus setting. So you may see trade schools, offices, research and medical labs, 
some manufacturing, as well as uses such as multifamily, restaurants, and retail. Those are our base zoning districts. And we also currently have a number of what are called overlay districts. So overlay districts do exactly that. They overlay the base district and they either add regulations to the current base zoning or they modify them based on, based on what is in the regulations. So our current overlay districts will be the same. We will, they will be mapped the same. Um, those include our Five Points, Inna Vista, North Main, and City Center Design Districts. Those are urban design districts that are administered by the DDRC. There is also the DP, we call them currently DP overlay districts or design preservation, which are now um, more logically called historic preservation overlay district to better designate their use. In addition, the existing community character districts will be mapped in the same location and those are in various neighborhoods as well. Our outdoor sign district remains, and that is a district that's applied by council um, on a case-by-case -case basis. We currently have airport overlay district, but it is more in the text as opposed to a map, which can oftentimes um, be rather difficult to explain. So this will actually show the airport safety overlay district. In addition, we have our floodway and floodplain districts, which in essence regulate what the, the FEMA maps show. So those will be part of our districts. We have new districts that came out of our West Gervais planning process. In addition to um, some of the experiences we had in the Inna Vista area, this is the height and setback view corridor districts. So that allows for a little bit extra height as long as the building sets back a certain amount um, within those areas. And that can be found within the West Gervais Street plan. Finally, one that will not be mapped at present, but may be part of a future planning process is a gateway design overlay district. This gives us a tool for our many gateways that after a planning process, if there are certain either um, design overlays or other types of regulations that would be useful to help implement that plan, that overlay district is there to help us. All right, so next we are gonna go through just a tutorial on how to use our draft zoning map. So I'm gonna stop my share and open up a new screen. All right, so and thank you all for bearing with us with this virtual format. So we few hiccups, but we are managing. So we have our proposed map here. So and a few tips and tricks to keep in mind with annexations. We, if those have been in the probably the past six to nine months, they may not be on this draft map, but we do have a list and we have assigned districts to those. So if you are looking for a property that has recently been annexed, please feel free to contact us in zoning and we'll let you know what is proposed. The same goes for split zoned properties. If you come across a property that does not have a district assigned to it, it is most likely split zoned. So what that means is it just has at least two zoning districts on one parcel. So we do have those mapped separately um, if you contact us with the TMS, we can send you that map showing that parcel specifically in what districts have been assigned. So just to show you how to a basic search on this, I will look up just the city building. All right, so and over on the right of the screen, we have our layer list. You want to make sure that that is open. The streets tab just shows you street ownership. So blue is city maintained roads, red would be DOT. It's important to keep pictometry on too so that you can see the visuals. And then you have your zoning district tab. 
So you have your proposed zoning district, which is automatically on. I suggest that you also have the current zoning district on at the same time. That'll show you what we currently have as well. That way you can compare the two. So when you click on the property, it's going to show you a pop up with two options. So you have your proposed zoning district, which we'll come back to in a moment. If you go to the second tab using these arrows, it'll show you that this property is currently C5, so our central business district. If you go back, you have two options. So you can click on the downtown activity center corridor, so the label of the district, and it will take you to a new window that'll show you a PDF of that new district and the requirements of that district. So you have a summary and the purpose of the district. And as you scroll down, it includes the intensity and dimensional standards of the district as well. So you can look at that and compare it to what is currently permitted in that district. You also have the option, if you click here, it'll open up a page in which you can submit a comment. So if you have a specific question or a, just a specific statement about what a property is zoned, you could submit it through here and that'll come to staff and we can address that question or look into your comment. And we'll go back to our slideshow here. So we do, we do want to hear from you. Um, we have a number of ways for you to provide input. Um, we have our email at zoningmap at columbiasc.gov. If you have some simple questions, please call the zoning office at 803-545-3333. And finally, where you can find a treasure trove of information on how we got here, the planning process that went into it, as well as the code, um, you can visit the website at weplantogether.org. If you just go to the main site at weplantogether.org, you will find the plan that is also being pursued by Richland County. We, we started on this um, journey together, um, going kind of side by side, um, checking in with each other from time to time. Um, we have the same consultant who helped us put the codes together as well, so that while they may not be the same, um, they, they do speak uh, to one another. Finally, we have a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings with a zoning code, a public meeting where you go over the different provisions of the code is appropriate. But when you're talking about actual zoning map, um, it doesn't necessarily provide the time that individuals may have to ask specific questions about their properties. So while people may be interested in the city as a whole, generally speaking, we find that people are interested in specific properties. So instead of trying to cram all of that into just a public meeting, we've set up opportunities for people for 15 minute increments um, to communicate with us. This time it'll be either via phone or via teleconference um, so that we can answer those specific questions. Um, appointments are required. Um, we do have a sign up sheet there at the weplantogether.org, the Columbia Review. And we hope you'll take advantage of those. If we, if we fill all of these up, we will definitely make more. We wanna make sure that we are able to explain this to everybody and get the questions answered that needs to be. Um, so we hope you'll take advantage of those. Um, and then keep, keep tabs with the We Plan Together for when the other upcoming meetings are going to be scheduled, both at the Planning Commission um, and at the City Council. All right, and before we go into questions, I just want to let everybody know that this video will be available on YouTube. So if you joined in late, um, you will be able to go back and watch the entire presentation from the beginning. So and I will post a link on our zoning page on our city website as well to that video on YouTube. 
And also, before we go into questions, I do want to take this opportunity to thank everybody, uh, citizens, uh, the Planning Commission, City Council, and in particular, our staff who have put in countless hours into making this a reality. Um, I don't think we mentioned that we have not uh, rewritten the zoning ordinance and maps since the 1970s. And so it's partially because it's a Herculean task to do so. And um, I, I don't take lightly the, the terrific work that everybody has put into this. So I thank you all. And um, I really look forward to this coming to fruition um, in the next year. So with that being said, um, we'll see whether there are any questions. And I know audio can be a bit delayed. So just Andrew, as soon as you hear us, let us know if we have any questions. Um, and please note that if you hit star three on your phone, that'll notify staff on public input that you wish to speak. So Andrew, do we have anybody with any questions? Hi, Krista. I currently do not have anyone with any questions, uh, but again, that, that would be star three if you wish to enter the queue to speak. Great, thank you, Andrew. We're waiting. We will go ahead. We we have received a number of questions from uh, from some folks in certain neighborhoods about the RM district. So I wanted to go ahead and kind of emphasize um, that the RM is analogous to the RG. So as you're taking a look at the current and proposed zoning districts, um, you will often find that in large part that the lines follow the same um, districts so that your current RGs um, will now be RMs. Um, this, this was intentional. We've often said that we wanted to largely keep those the same. Um, residential districts have been working um, fairly well. So that is uh, one reason we kept those. So for those folks who have had questions about those RM districts, um, it is not necessarily a rezoning, although we are giving them different names, um, but we are taking that RG and um, converting it into the RM. So and another concern that I can kind of address now as well that has come through a few times on our zoning map at columbiasc.gov email is from commercial owners who are concerned that by rezoning corridors we might be making their business non-conforming. I do just want to touch on that and say that our goal in this remapping was not to create a great deal of new non-conformities. We tried to work with what was existing as well as looking at our future land use and our plans for that area. So I definitely just want to make it clear we did not create new non-conformities for ourselves. Staff doesn't like to deal with those either. <laughs> So we definitely did not do that. So Andrew, any any hands raised at this point? Uh, Krista, no, I do not have any hands raised. Uh, so the callers that are on the line, I think, are content to listen. That's fantastic. We're, we're glad to hear it. Now we we do hope that some of these folks will sign up for the for the one on one meetings to allow us to. Um, explain the differences if there are any. We're hopeful that this um, simply means that that it's fairly clear to everybody uh, what what the changes are or that they really just need to get in there and, and dig into it, which we completely understand. Um, with regard to the nonconformities too, um, Rachel, do you want to just talk a little bit about if in the off chance we do have a use that um, is made non-conforming, it doesn't mean that they have to shut their business, that they are allowed oh. to continue to operate. Correct. So if there is a business that becomes non-conforming, um, as long as it continues to operate with proper licensing and everything, 
without any vacancy or abandonment of 12 months or more, it can continue in perpetuity. Um, we would not, just because some nonconformities may be created with this, those would be able to continue until damage beyond repair or something along those terms. Very similar to our nonconformity status right now. So for example, homes that were built in the 20s and 30s are technically nonconforming under our current ordinance that was adopted in the 70s. But those houses have remained. Um, and we are often able to work with what is there and what's existing without any issue. And one of the goals of the code too is to try to limit what is nonconforming. So for instance, when our last zoning ordinance was written in the 70s, we were largely trying to go towards a more suburban model um, based on the plans from the 60s. And at that time, there really wasn't much of a respect for our fabulous historic districts that we have now. So the, the regulations were written trying to encourage that suburban type development with larger setbacks, um, not really taking into account that most of our neighborhoods at the time uh, were these uh, districts of, of more narrow setbacks of historic proportions. So our new districts, our new zoning ordinance will allow for that type of development to continue. So for instance, now, if you live in Elmwood Park, um, you may have to get a variance to, in essence, build the right thing, build something that's compatible in the neighborhood because it doesn't necessarily meet the setbacks. Um, our new code gives staff a lot more tools to make that development as of right when it is compatible with the existing development. So there's a lot of terrific tools in the new code to try to encourage that type of compatible development, both in our residential districts, as well as in our commercial districts and, and limit those compatible developments from having to go through hoops that really they, they shouldn't have to. So we'll take a moment and Andrew, see if there's anything I do have a caller that, that joined in that does have um, a question. So I will patch them through. All right. Uh, hello, my name is Scott Hurt, and I was just wondering what the planning and development uh, department took into account for sustainability and environmental initiatives while making this plan. Certainly, thank you. Thank you for your call. So it's in the code itself that you find a lot of the, as I mentioned, the, the fourth um, key theme was the sustainable and green options. So it's within the regulations itself, and, and I'd be happy to, to share some of those with you if, if you get in contact at the zoning maps. So it encourages development. We've got some green building incentives now within our code that we did not previously have. Um, and it's point based, um, based on how many different types of practices that you put into your development, um, you can gain points based on those. In addition, we have open space uh, requirements now within our code that we did not previously have. So that is, um, will allow for greater, greater open space in our developments. Um, we now have bicycle regulations within the code um, and bicycle parking regulations um, to facilitate that mode of transportation, as well as trying to, in new development, ensure that they're interconnected um, to decrease traffic. So there's a whole host of um, regulations in our new code um, that facilitate that. Um, and we'd be happy to kind of point you in the right direction if uh, you need any help uh, finding it. As we mentioned previously, the code can be found at the weplantogether.org site. Also encourage you to look at what um, our planning staff, they have just completed uh, fantastic work on the Columbia Compass, which is our comprehensive plan for 10 years. Um, I am so proud of them. It's a fantastic document and there is uh, an element there, the 
the natural resources, but it's really intertwined without. They, they didn't use boundaries on any of the major themes. And I encourage you to look at that, the columbiacompass.org to find those recommendations and policies um, for, for those sustainable initiatives. Thank you. Andrew, anything else? Um, that does appear to be all the callers we have. Okay. Well, we're a little early. We will um, we'll give it just a few minutes here, and uh, we might we might speak up with something else. We can go back over um, our contact information as well, just to reiterate. Um, again, emails to do with the map, or even if you have questions about the text. So if the caller wants to um, contact us to learn more about those green incentives, um, please feel free to email us at zoningmap at columbiasc.gov. So those emails go to a few staff members. So we are checking those and we try to get back to you within 24 hours with that information. To, um, you can also contact us at 803-545-3333. That is our main zoning line. And you can also find a great deal of information at the weplandtogether.org slash Columbia Review. That's the direct page for our part of that site. And that has the full text of the ordinance as adopted, as well as the draft map viewer. It also gives you the opportunity to sign up for our one on one meetings or submit a comment to staff. So again, with the one on one meetings right now, we are currently offering those on the 30th, October 1st, the 2nd, the 7th and the 8th. You can always add more if needed. Appointments are required. There's a sign up sheet again on that weplantogether.org. You can also contact us by phone or by email at that zoning map at columbiasc.gov to sign up for those appointments. As you go through the code too, you'll find that it is organized in a far more logical fashion um, so that you're, you should be able to find the uh, specific information you want pretty, pretty quickly. In addition, if you're able to reach, if you're able to look at it through the PDF online, it also has hyperlinks within the actual document itself. But it starts out with charts that flow charts that show you based on what you want to do, um, what the actual process is for that, whether it's going to the Board of Zoning Appeals or to Planning Commission. It tells you who is involved and, and who needs to make a decision. And then it, and it also defines those people's roles who are involved. So for instance, um, Rachel is a zoning administrator. It tells you the roles that she has in the development process, as well as the planning commission and the zoning, zoning board. So before we didn't really have that, that actual direction of what are the roles and what are the steps necessary. Then after you get through the administration and you go into the zoning districts, we use pictures because they do um, tell a thousand words. And so instead of just a bunch of tables and charts that can sometimes numb your mind, um, we also insert character pictures in there. They are not regulatory, it's actual text that's regulatory, but it helps you say, if you wanna say, what is that side setback? It shows you where that actually is for each of those districts. And then it goes into the use regulations. So now you know what the districts are, what are allowed in there. And it used to be that we had a table of uses that was based on a code um, that no longer was uh, updated after the 1980s. And so some of the uses were fairly outdated. And so this is much more modern and, and simplified as well. And what is fantastic about it is in the back of the code, you will find actual definitions that in everyday people's language tells you what that use means and, and what may fall into that. Um, and then it has some, the development standards. So landscaping, um, parking, lighting, it tells you uh, what the different regulations are for those. 
And then land development, it used to be a separate section in the code. And the reason we call this a unified code is because we're bringing together zoning and land development now. And so those standards, so for subdivisions, what are the standards? And it refers to our engineering standards as well. Um, a really neat new development pattern that goes towards the sustainability that we have the option of now is a cluster, is a um, cottage development. So um, cottage style houses um, that are around a green or open space, um, we have the ability to have those types of developments now. And finally, we define kind of all of the rules of measurement. You know, how is it that the zoning staff is gets to how they measure the height. Before it used to be just standard practice that we knew um, for a lot of these things, but now it's actually laid out. So we hope that you'll find that it's, it's, it's easier to understand and it gives you a lot more tools um, to get the kind of development that we've, we've always hoped for. Um, so Andrew, one more time, we'll see if there's any other questions. Otherwise, um, we'll call in an evening. Uh, Krista, I do not have any um, hands raised at the moment. All right, thank you, Andrew. And thank you everyone for tuning in to our presentation. I hope you are as excited as we are to get this process wrapped up and get this code and map effective in March of 2021. And again, please feel free to reach out to us with any questions. So we're always happy to discuss and assist. Yes, and indeed, thank you. And thank you to you, Andrew, and to the good folks of PR, Justin, for your assistance this evening in, in this virtual format. Um, we couldn't do it without our IT and PR folks. They've been behind the scenes supporting us and we appreciate you. So, and thank you to all who have listened tonight and hopefully have see it again. So um, we wish you all a, a good evening. Have a good night.